Hey, welcome back to Chris Dyer's Creative Friends, the super awesome podcast show where me, your artist friend Chris Dyer, talks to all his awesome artistic friends. So this winter, I've been living in Denver, Colorado. Very interesting experience. And there's a shitload of visionary artists out here, but I keep to myself a lot. Uh, but one artist I've been hanging out quite a bit is uh, this funny character called John Gay. This is uh, somebody who's very interesting and soulful and has lots of personality. So I think you're really gonna enjoy this, this episode. We're gonna meet up for our classic uh, Mexican and Margaritas lunch and, uh, and then go from there to his studio. So yeah, enjoy, woo! Between the women and a man, Chris Dyer and his creative friends, darling. Ooh, 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 all right, John, boom. How's thank you for having me over your oh, beautiful yeah. home welcome, studio. Welcome to the house. Yeah. The thanks. humble abode. Yeah, it's, it's great out here in Aurora, Denver. Yeah. And uh, we just went out for lunch at yep. Illegal Pete's. Yeah. Had some margaritas. Some margaritas. It's becoming like a weekly thing now. It, it should be a weekly thing because I, I need to get out more with you guys. I enjoy it. <laughs> yeah. I enjoy it, but it also hurts me. <laughs> Last, oh, you last said you were hungover last. Dude, last week when we went to fucking Aguascalientes, that place is deadly. It is. <laughs> but the time before that, I don't think I had been that drunk since college, which was probably 15 years ago. Dude, so. like, no, it reminded me of my college Ooh, days yeah, where you yeah. get so drunk that you're just inhabilitated. I was, I was so worried for myself. I was like, damn it. I didn't mean to get that drunk. It's two margaritas. Well, yeah, you only did one last week. I, know. I did two, and then we went back home, and then there were this box of white claws, and oh, I, I just that. I was so drunk that you just keep on drinking and drinking, you don't even notice, <laughs> and then you don't even drink water before you go to sleep because you're that drunk. But I think I passed out on the kitchen table before you left, no? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Because I went down and was like, where did they go? What happened? <laughs> you and Corey both were about out. Dude, I was like, I'm going, I'm out. Th that was like a like a free day hangover, man. Like they, it, it really, I, I, I that, pooped that, properly for many days. That waitress there. looks after us up there. I think she, she likes Corey. I think she does. <laughs> yep. Yeah, and yep. she just gives us the strongest margarita. She's does. like top shelf, right? Yes. Yeah, but, but I swear she puts two shots now instead of one. Possibly. I don't I know. Don't she know. might just pour a bottle like. Pfft. Something, but uh, yeah, anyways, at least we did like illegal peats, which is like the gringo yep. version of a, <laughs> yeah. of a Mexican yep. spot, uh, <laughs> but it's delicious and, and yeah. a good way, way to get warmed up for this interview. So thank you for having me over. Let's wish Corey good luck with repairing the tire of his van. We'll see if we get a text message. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Hopefully well, he's all right. Good luck, Corey. He's a he's a grown up. He can do these things. So John. Uh, do you know, can you remember more or less like how long we know each other or where we met? I met you at the second Gratify. It was really? Like 2014. Okay. I, I met you. That was the year that I, I was just, I, mean, I was about two years in the live painting at festivals. Okay. And I remember hitting up Andy Reid on Facebook. Hey, if any of the artists back out, can I come paint? And he was like, eh, it's probably not going to happen, but I have an extra ticket if you want to come help build the gallery. Mm -hmm. So I was ecstatic. I remember like, I remember running around my room like, yes, 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 yes. Because just, I mean, the music line, it was great. The festival looked cool. I know they'd already had a year of it, mm -hmm. but the artist lineup was banging. And right. I'm like, you know, it's like being in college and, and, and learning art history. You're like, oh, Picasso and Rembrandt, you know, and Monet. And we have all these different artists that we're like learning about. 
but you're never gonna meet them. But then you have like, in our time, we have social media. Mm -hmm. So you have like artists that are established that, like yourself at the time, I'm like, there's Chris Dyer, Randall Roberts, Ashley Foreman, um, gosh, who else? Uh, Michael Garfield, Morgan, was there. Morgan Mandala, uh, Crystal Eyes. Dela probably. Dell was there. Jonathan uh, Salter. Salter. That was the year I met Salter too. A yeah. huge influence. Um, yeah. Uh, I Mr. Melty probably? I had already met Kevin by that time. Uh -huh. um, Kevin's one of my favorite. Was he there? I can't remember if he was there or not. Actually, I don't think he was I there think that second Root year. Wire, but. Yeah, that was one year that we were all there. Uh, or not Root Wire, but Earth Dance is where I met Kevin at. And okay. you were there one year. I went, uh, yeah, 2016. Yeah. That's when I remember meeting you. Yeah. That's why you told me Gratiflies. Oh, really? We met yeah, at Earth Dance? Yeah, we met at that was I was jaw dropped that year. I was, like, Olga Komova was there. It's yeah. just like, I mean, I remember looking around like, oh. Like shaking people's hands. It's probably kind of intimidated. Oh, you know, you yeah, follow, you look yeah. Because I came to paint. I was like, I'm coming to paint. Like, I am doing this. You know, I am pursuing this. And I thought that was a great opportunity to go and socialize and mingle with a lot of the artists that, it, like, looking in a history book, I'd look at on Facebook. Like, they're all West Coast artists, you know. I'm, don't I'm Canadian out. from yeah, yeah. <laughs> the <laughs> international <laughs> international art like a lot of y'all coming over I was just kind of like I need to go to this mm -hmm. somehow some way and I wanted to try to go for my art and I did more say but I went to help build the gallery which did I you helped. show your art I painted with you and no, I didn't show it in the gallery or anything but I hell I swear I met Corey. Mm -hmm. I think the first oh, time nice. I met Corey. Yeah, I think that's where I met Corey. Yeah, uh, Jerry. This Corey time. is my brand manager, by the way. <laughs> if you guys don't know him. <laughs> yeah, it's I. You know that that particular festival uh, helped helped me like mingle with a lot of my you know favorite artists that I looked up to, and that's what was so cool uh, about going to that festival. And showing, I mean, I sat there and painted that that painting right there. Okay, at, nice. at Gratify. That's great. That's a great yeah, painting. Yeah, so, well, I never. For saw me, it was overwhelming because there were so many like artists that were still new to me. Yeah, yeah. So you're I still was, meeting your heroes too at the time, kind of thing. Well, just different generations. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, like yeah. my generation was like people my age and older, like mm -hmm. uh, Amanda Sage, Luke yeah. Brown, Carrie Thompson, Romer mm -hmm. Via Granda. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Autumn Sky. Yeah. So I met them around 2010, mm -hmm. and yep. this Gratify was 2014. Uh, it was 14. the la the second year Gratify. The, right. the final year was 14. And then when I remember meeting you it was 2016 at, at Earth, Earth Dance. Dance. Yeah. And by then you seemed like pretty established. To, 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 from my observation. You were there painting, you were confident, you had your personality, and to be honest, it rubbed me kind of the wrong way. <laughs> but you have in those days. <laughs> but uh, you also uh, had assistant uh, uh, Morgan, Morgan Warren. Warren, yeah, Morgan, yep. Yeah, she was your oh, assistant. Yeah. So. yeah, that was one of those, um, you know, she was an up and coming artist at the time, too, and like, she's doing great now, I'm so proud of her, but like, she, uh, Oh, she made me so mad that weekend. More, you made me so mad. She remembers. <laughs> um, she, uh, I was like, I was trying to paint the murals, and I needed somebody to watch the table. And she's an artist. I got it. I totally understand. Because I mean, at the same time, it's like holding up a responsibility that somebody asks you to do, but you're like, I'm here in this moment, and I have an opportunity to take two. So she was painting too. You know, I don't blame her. I love, I love her to death. I'm so proud of her. Um, yeah, but yeah, that was, those were early, still early days. Like I started live painting in 2012, 13, 14, it's gratify. I was still kind of establishing myself. Were you living in Georgia back then? Yeah, Atlanta. How I, was living in Georgia, in Atlanta, as a visionary artist? Was there any scene for that there? That there was you, a, yeah, there was a little scene there. It was... So I grew up in South Georgia, and I grew up, I went to college in Valdosta, which is like right there on the Florida line. So I had an opportunity. I grew up in Florida too, but there's not a lot going on in North Florida in the Gulf area where I grew up in that area of South Georgia too, because my, my mom and dad lived in two different areas. Um, but South Florida had it always popping, but I never went to South Florida. I didn't know anybody in South Florida when I was in college, but I met a lot of Atlanta people. 
Uh, it seems like the, the North Georgia folk, when they graduated high school, wanted to get out of North Georgia, so they went south. But all the South Georgia kids wanted to go north. Mm. But I just, I stayed south. Everybody went to UGA or Georgia Southern. Um, I wanted, I just wanted to get an art degree. I didn't really know what I was, I just needed to get my art degree. Mm -hmm. I didn't know how I was going to pursue it yet. Um, <clears throat> so I was getting in college and I went to Valdosta. So I met a lot of Atlanta kids. Okay. And the Atlanta kids grew up in the city. They had a lot more opportunities going on, a lot more live music like that they had seen. I, at that time of my life, I think I'd seen Leonard Skinner, and it wasn't even the original members, you know? So it wasn't a lot of like music I didn't, I had, I was fortunate enough for my stepdad to listen to classic rock. My mom was really into music too. <clears throat> my dad, not so much. He grew up in the six, he grew up in the 70s, 60s and 70s, but he was never really that much into music. So I think my musical taste kind of came from my stepdad and my mom, which is kind of eclectic. I mean, my stepdad's very Southern. He's a cotton consultant. Um, works in farms and fields, but he listens like Led Zeppelin and the Grateful Dead mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So you had so, a cool influence. Yeah, I had that great musical influence growing up because I also worked scouting cotton during the summer for from like sixth grade until I graduated <laughs> high school. Scouting cotton? Yeah, what so I would walk through fields and look to see if there was any harmful insects that were damaging the cotton so to let the, the farmer know what kind of pesticides to spray on the, huh. the plant or the field in order to keep the crop growing. Wow. So I did that for many, many years. Um, Was it like piece work or hour work? Oh, we worked from sun up to sundown. Okay. Um, Damn. Yeah, when day. did you get into art? I'd already been doing art. I was so like, I mean, I've been drawing and I've been drawing since I can remember. Um, and I, I think honestly, it's just because I was an only child and it was just me and my mom for right. most of my life. It wasn't, in, I, you know, my stepdad didn't come along until I was in seventh grade. Okay. Um, but I didn't. your dad? My dad, you know, he's always been there. He's been around, but. <laughs> He, you know, he's also like, he'd be a pain in my ass too, love him to death. He's, he's been great too, but growing up, it was not, I don't think, that sounds bad, I don't think I was much of a priority for him, mm -hmm. but obviously to my mother, I she's got to raise me. Right. So like, she was my mother and my father, like, she'd she'd fucking get on to me if she had to, and she would be like very like disciplined and comforting when she had to. Um, but my dad was more like an older, kind of like an older friend, or maybe an older sibling. She, like, like, I don't wanna get into your dad for too long, but you were telling me earlier today in lunch that he got lost at sea two times, yes. and he was like some kind of crazy white wild card. So my dad, yeah, he has a very interesting story. Long story short, he went to Vietnam, he survived. He went when he was 18. Wow. Uh, when he got back, he went to college to, be a, uh, to get his criminal justice degree. He wanted to work for the GBI in Georgia and he failed the lie detector test for smoking weed. So you can't reapply, I know it's pretty wild. You can't reapply for six months. So him being impatient and kind of pissed off at the time he dips, moves to Panama Canal, meets some Colombians, and gets mixed up in the whole drug cartel um, <clears throat> for quite a while. This is not incriminating, sorry, Dad. Yeah, <laughs> I'm um, sure no cops so watching this show. He, uh, <laughs> he, you know, he got into a lot of he got into a lot of he got into a lot of adventures and a lot a lot of trouble. Uh, like I was telling you, he got his fingers cut off running from the cops in an airplane, trying to shut a door, and he got his fingers cut off the propeller. He's been lost at sea twice, once with my mother. That was the second time. That was, that was where I was conceived. I was conceived in the Bermuda Triangle, yes. <laughs> for, my parents were lost for 28 days. What? Yeah, they were trying to leave. So they were trying to get to Bimini, and they left out of Fort Lauderdale. Uh, and a storm blew them off course. So my dad fought the storm using his gas in the boat, in the sailboat. Uh -huh. didn't use, it wasn't sailing, obviously. You, know, you pull your sails down. But... He, uh, they lost radio contact and he was not sure where he was at once the storm ended and they floated for 28 days 
out the Bermuda. What did they eat? They had plenty of food. Okay. They had plenty of supplies. They just didn't know where they were at, and they couldn't find. They they couldn't. Nobody was around. There was no boats. So anything coming around until on the twenty eighth day, there there was one of the I guess the Air Force area out of Fort Lauderdale was doing a one of those practice runs, uh-huh. and it was a one of those huge. Uh, carrier planes, oh. big ones that had flown over and they had heard it and saw it coming. So my dad ran over there and got on the radio and it's like, mayday, mayday, like we're stranded, stranded. So they, heard, they got contact with them and told them that they would be sending the... the Helicopter? Well, what do you call them? The, not, the, the, I, the, the ocean... Yeah, the security Baywatch. Navy people would come Baywatch. out there. They're, they're yeah, Baywatch, Baywatch come out <laughs> on their surfboards and pick them up. Um, no, but they said that um, they did like a second flyby and dropped some cargo for them out in the ocean. Um, food and stuff like just that. Just in case. Just in case. Um, this people was, must be starving. And it was funny because my dad was like, yeah, like we're all out there sunbathing naked and he's like we heard the we heard the plane coming and he's like i yelled judy judy put your clothes on i'm about to go radio contact there's a plane coming but i was like you know i can't imagine being out there for 28 days just i mean you know my mom and dad would be like you couldn't see anything there was just the horizon was was ocean and the sky there was no land around you have no idea where you're at and that's when you got conceived yeah yeah there was nothing else to do is what they said there was nothing else for us to do um, the, yeah, there was that's also... Like, that's a great... Con- that's yeah, a great yeah, you know, I, I mean, with my my alien artwork and stuff, kind of, like, makes sense. My name was in the Bermuda Triangle. Yeah, they had floated right out, because from... It's from, um, Fort Lauderdale to... I can't remember what I It might be Bermuda, and then down. Mm-hmm. That's the triangle. Right. But I think Bermuda's down, and there's something Yeah, else. there was another one up, Maybe yeah. that's that sunken pyramid at the bottom of that, the ocean. Yeah, that's exactly. That's dis- yeah. destabilizing that yeah. whole area. Yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. Um, yeah, that's, that's my dad's. So cool. That's my dad. That's my dad's story. I guess All I'm right, intertwined so I'm gonna, in it. I'm going to take it away from your family. All right. So you were in Georgia, and what? You went to school, and when did you move to Denver? Like, so I, I graduated college in 2009, and I sat around for three years, kind of a sore situation that I was in, sitting around in my college town for three years. I won't get into that, but I, you know, Jared. Not, yeah, no, it wasn't there. I'll tell you that. It was a college friend. He had moved up to um, Atlanta. And by this time, you know, after three years of sitting in my college town after I'd already graduated, your friends that you went to school with start moving off. So I took it as an opportunity where my buddy had hit me up and said he was moving into the city. I was like, I'm, I'm coming. So I packed up my stuff and I moved to Atlanta. Um, and then I lived in this little spot for about a year and a half with my, one of my college buddies. And talk about struggling. Like, I thought, you know, I'm moving to Atlanta and pursue my art. That was, that was the point of that. It's like a great little transition city, had a great music hub, art hub. Mm-hmm. Uh, everything was supposed to be good. And I got up there and I was like, uh-oh, I got to find a job. Um, I remember my car broke down. I didn't have a car for about a year and a half living in the city. I'm a, I'm from the South. I don't... Are public, you country? Public transportation. We had maybe two taxis in our town. Like, I didn't know anything about that kind of stuff. Um, you know, I went to college, went to New York for a week. So that was my first time ever getting on public transportation, subways, taxis, anything like that. So I, when I moved to Atlanta, I'd, obviously I'd been on it. But it was great, it was forceful. Like I had to get to my job every day. Mm-hmm. So I had to take the bus and the train to get there. And then I wouldn't get off and I'd have to wait an hour to get back, you know, wait for an hour after mm-hmm. I get off of work to get the bus, take to the train. Like it was a pain in the ass, but it was great that I was going through mm-hmm. all that stuff. It was and teaching you all responsibility yeah, yeah. and yeah. taking care of yourself. Yeah, it's like, you know, you're not calling mom or dad, hey, mm-hmm. I need help. Like you gotta do this on your own. Yeah. And so, you know, I learned to kind of survive in the Atlanta area, in that city, which is great. I loved Atlanta. So it's, you know, kind of a smaller city. And the scene for us, like the painting scene, you know, there was one venue you could paint at, in aisle five, and they allowed it. The rest of the venues that you had around, like Terminal West and a few others, 
It's like you didn't have live painting unless maybe the mus musical act wanted it there. But even the venue owners are like, you know, pretty particular about where you're going and like where you're setting up. So, but when I moved there, I went in there for maybe like two months and there was a an emancipator contest at Terminal West and you just post your art. And I posted a piece, I got second place. Nobody knew me, that was a thing. Like, I, you know, a lot of people that had entered from Atlanta, I, I felt it like it was great that a lot of people were voting on my piece, even though they didn't know who I was. They just really liked my art. Mm -hmm. I got second place, and the guy that put on the contest that was giving the tickets away was like, you know, you, you got second place, we're getting the first place person to come paint, but we'll give you an extra ticket. Like, you can come and come to the show. So I came to the show, and I met the artist that was painting, and I met, I met a few other who people. Who was it? I cannot remember her name because I'm not sure if she actually kept pursuing her artwork. Usually I keep up with them if they keep pursuing it. And I, social media keeps the names circulated. Right. And I, I cannot, I don't think that mm -hmm. she's even on social media anymore. I don't remember who it was exactly. But, but that inspired you? It made, you just, it made me feel good that I was going out mingling with Atlanta people that I, being a uh, hermit as I was, made me mingle in a new city where I, I was, if I needed to survive, if I was gonna survive in this city as an artist, I had to go out and do this. Mm -hmm. uh, even though my insecurities were like, no, I don't do that, don't leave the house. Um, so I went out, met them, I met like Tiffany Epiphany, uh, another friend, Jordan. Jordan later on put on a festival, which was my first painting festival. First time painting at a festival. What was it called? Unitas, it was in North Georgia. Um, I actually met Michael Garfield there and Blaze Bellinoy. Mm -hmm. at this festival. Um, Claire Godby, Tiffany Epiphany, and Karina Graves. All these people I just mentioned have all, like, still are a part of my life. Yeah. And I never heard Tiffany Epiphany. Yeah, she cool was from, yeah, she was from <laughs> Georgia. She was cool. Um, and that was what was cool about it because you had met a lot of local artists that were doing the same thing I was, even though I didn't know who they were and they already had kind of knew each other. I was just Mm -hmm. coming into the scene. How long were you there uh, were, uh, getting into that scene? Like how many I years was in Atlanta? I lived in Atlanta from 2012 to 2017, so I guess five years. Nice. And that's when Jared, Jared Trantham was living in Oregon. He was one of the guys, because I got started at Swanee down in Florida. Before I ever started live painting, I was selling prints. Like, like look at my art, you know, trying to just at least make my money back for my ticket that I just took out of rent to come down to this festival. Right. Um, but Jerry, I'd met him year. Jerry from Los Sailor? Yeah, Los Sailor Weather, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'd met him, he was doing like galleries and stuff. And I, he approached me probably one day when I was standing on the corner trying to sell my art prints. He's like, why don't you just come do this in the gallery? Right. That's like, nice. how do I do this? He's uh -huh. like, applications online. Uh -huh. Okay, so this is, and I remember seeing Emily Kell. Emily Kell and Christian Jacksheimer, Bonnie Goodson, Christian Goodry, they were like some of the few ones I saw at Bear Creek in like 2010, 2011. Um, I wasn't live painting yet. At that point in time, I'd never seen any live painters except for Lebo down at Langerado in 2009. Mm -hmm. or 2008, I've never seen live painters before. And I've been going to festivals since 2007, hardcore. Mm -hmm. Been to all kinds of festivals, never seen It took a while to have painter. picked up, especially in the East Coast. Yeah, so in 2010, I saw that crew at the Swanee painting. And Emily's was one of the, f I was like, she's painting all these goddess figures. I called mine deities, I was like, we're, we're like on the same level. Yeah, so she, from the same dimension. Yeah, I was literally like, she, you know, I still credit her. She's the reason I picked up a paintbrush. Emily? I didn't think that I, that was a thing. I didn't know that my two worlds were about to collide where I, my festival, my love for a festival scene and what I was trying to pursue in my life with art we're about to collide. And I saw her and I was like, you can do this? Mm -hmm. And I was, you know, at the time selling prints and that's when Jared's like, why don't you try this in the gallery? I'm like, how do you, how do you do this? Mm -hmm. So I started painting so I could go to festivals. That's why I paint. 
because I saw her painting stuff. But you like, but you were painting because you wanted to paint, but also you wanted to not have to pay for the tickets to be at the yeah, events that were like, like I was like, you culturally, right? I was trying, yeah, my, you know, the festival scene had changed my life a lot. Um, it made me want, it, you know, two or three years I was selling prints, people would come back every year, like, I got your print last year. It's the greatest feeling ever. And they're like, come back the third year, like, I got, I got to get this one this year. And, you know, I'm very, I'm not the type of person that's going to go through the campgrounds. Hey, look at my prints. You want to buy some prints? I'm yeah, like, standing so on the corner, like, do you, like, if you like my print, I got them for sale. So it made me feel really good that people would come by and want to buy my prints. And it kind of makes you feel a little bit more confident. Um, to want to try to pursue what what I had just witnessed with like these few artists that I saw at Bear Creek painting. So it's like awesome. I'm gonna try to do this, and it started popping off. I remember going to this festival fly free. I reached out to my buddy Chance Losher. I didn't know him at the time, but I was like, I knew he was painting or was in charge of the gallery, so I hit him up. RJD2 was playing. I'd never seen RJD2. I really Sorry. wanted to see RJD2. Mm -hmm. um, and he's like, yeah, I think we can squeeze you in. It's the most, like, I didn't apply. I didn't do it. It's like, I, at, these, at these years of my life, I was kind of, I guess, unprofessionally reaching out, trying to figure out how to go about But doing, that's how you did that's how, Yeah, it's, I had to learn somehow. And, you know, Chance is one of my best friends now. Like, you know, these people that I... You have so much more success reaching out to human beings, being like, yo, Just what's the fit here, than going and filling up a form and hoping that whoever reads that form vibes right. with what right. you wrote on that form. Right, right. <laughs> I just, you know, I also took it as like, everybody has a Facebook. Like, I'm sure I can reach out to this person right. without going through some everybody's, email on their website. Everybody's accessible. Right. right. So, you know, those early times, I mean, thank God for like, social media. like. It's the great. It's one of the greatest tools for an artist these days. Even though these algorithms are like screwing us up right now, <laughs> golly, like uh, for like you know for a short time, it was it was a really awesome tool. I and mean, you look at our parents' generation. My dad was freaking out because I got an art degree. Like, what are you gonna do? What are you gonna do? Uh -huh. What are you going to do with that? Yeah. I don't know. Like, uh -huh. but this is what I'm. I this is what I've been told I was good at. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You didn't tell me I was good at math, mm -hmm. which I wasn't. You didn't tell me I was good at science. You didn't tell me I was good at sports. You didn't tell me I was good at... But I was always told I was good at art. So I'm like, all right, well, that'd be dumb not to pursue what I've been told I was good at. But, right. you know, I look back and I'm like, I think I'm like, I didn't really have to go to college. But if I didn't go to college, I would have never met the people that took me to my first festival. College so, is necessary, even if the things that you learned in college wasn't what you did in the end. It's just hmm. time for to, like... To get to know yourself yeah, like, really and to is. give yourself some yep. time and room to figure out like yep. okay what direction i want to go to i had a really good professor um who was very just relaxed he was he was what i would consider like a true artist he you would walk up to him and, and like his pieces 30 30 to fifty thousand dollar pieces that he'd have on the wall in our college classroom and studio and he'd be working on his pieces and you'd be like Allie, like what are you doing I don't know. And he'd just be making marks. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, just the sheer fact of the answer of, I don't know what I'm doing. Right. Was so inspiring it's to liberating. me. liberating. Yeah. You don't have to know what you're doing. Yeah. You gotta do it. Yeah, and I'm like, he's a successful person. He was like, I wanted to become a professor because I saw my professor teaching people to push their boundaries while he worked on his own stuff and got paid to do it. It's like, genius. Mm -hmm. Genius. Mm -hmm. Like... I mean, hell, I'm even kind of still thinking about, I can get a two-year master's degree, I got my four-year, I get a two-year master's degree, teach classes if I need to. Mm -hmm. And, you know, kind of be maybe set if I start struggling, as, which right. I don't want to put that out, I don't know. Like, I think I'm doing... No, I, I, I resonate, because when I went to college, it's like, well, if I take enough like formal schooling, if the art career doesn't go well, at least I could teach something. Right, it's, a, it's a okay... It's a liberating, good backup plan, I think, you know? And it's one of those where people would ask me, if you did teach, where would you want to teach? And I'm like, I well, definitely not want to teach elementary. I don't know, elementary might be kind of cool. Middle school, high school? No way. Like, if you wanted to be in that class, like, I want you to want to learn. I'm not trying to sit here and teach some punk kid that right, is trying I'm to. Right, force him to do something uh, you want to do. Yeah. 
Yeah. And plus, I, cause I think I would be a cool teacher. I don't want any like punk kids that Fuck don't like you. me. Like, oh, I'm yeah. I'm the coolest teacher you'll ever see. Yeah. I'm an art teacher. I, I just wouldn't do that. College I, would I, be the one. I taught a couple of uh, a little bit of elementary, but mm -hmm. mostly high school workshops, free yeah. day workshops. Yeah, yeah. So I did several of those in, in Montreal, and it was a really interesting experience and as as you say those students the the teenagers and they send me a lot of to the trouble kids school because oh, it's like yeah, i was yeah. teaching like skateboard art painting and i'm right. a dude with dreadlocks it's like right. okay let's send the oh, cool teacher yeah, right to the trouble kids and they still fuck with me but i you know i'm an adult so i don't care uh and and they make you questions you know so it's it was helpful but i was like fuck no i would not want to work on right. this forever <laughs> right right it's one of those like I mean, in that moment, you might you might have changed some kid's life at that particular time. Maybe at the moment it didn't seem that way, but maybe at some point in time it would. But for your own like personal mental health to sit there and have to deal with something like that yearly, and not you know, it's too repetitive too. Yeah, you have to use yeah, the same yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. College, you know, college is one of those like my professors like well, I'll teach painting this semester, mm -hmm. but then I'll teach like drawing three you know in the next semester but i'm not teaching painting mm -hmm. so it's like getting that alternation and like, have you ever can, taught workshops in the no, have you ever actually, in general no i've actually thought i've had a few people reach out um i've thought about it i am a little insecure about my process dude you got a thing down you what you do you got it down and to teach that would be great I feel like I would have to, I don't think that I couldn't teach it to someone. I think that I would need to get my steps lined up or either verbally ready in a sense of like, this is what I'm explaining to you while I'm doing it. I can sit here and tell you what I'm, right now I'm doing this and this is why I'm doing it. But sometimes I'll even get lost in my process and be like, oh, all right, I gotta go back and like do this. I understand that the insecurity of being a teacher, especially to adults instead of right. kids, but I was that way at the beginning, and uh, I had to just do it to then even realize, like, mm -hmm. oh shit, these are adults and they are artists, but there's a lot that they don't know that I know. No, to right. that I know. Right. And then the more workshops that there's, like, oh, they also don't know about this. Oh, they also don't know about that. And then you'll discover as you teach that you got a lot to share. You know, like bringing that up, that's even in college, we. You know, you had one, say, painting professor or a drawing professor. You're only learning, like, their technique. Mm -hmm. When I got into festivals and I started meeting all these other artists, I don't know how many different techniques I think I witnessed that I could have learned from just sitting there and watching somebody. Um, mm -hmm. So, like, coming in, I used to tell people, like, you know, I'd obviously probably charge for it now. <laughs> but I used to tell people, like, because it was like an enticing thing. I want to know who would be interested. I will teach you everything I know that I paid 30 plus thousand dollars to learn right. for free wow. if you want to learn it. Uh -huh. No takers. Really? If you want to learn I mean, it? Like not even an intern situation that it would help you with your painting? I don't know if anybody actually took it took me that seriously about it, but I, there was multiple people that I, like, I will teach you. But what about Morgan? Was she like helping you? Morgan, yeah, Morgan. Actually, you know, uh, when I Morgan first came around, I was actually taking notes on her color theory. I was like, I, I can teach you some stuff. Or you're teaching me some stuff too. Now, so it's like, that's why I'm, I'm super proud of her. She's done a really great job with her uh, art career. But you got the flow, dude. You got a good flow, Thanks. and that's something that's hard to teach. But. Um, you know, as you said, people got to kind of like look at you and try to figure out why you did that line. Right, right, nowhere. right, right. I my you know, I use a lot of water. I don't use a lot of medium. Um, and I actually learned that from Salter. Mm -hmm. uh, why water instead of medium? Well, so at the time I was, I was at a festival and I didn't have any medium. And I remember Salter telling me that you can use medium, but you can also use water as he's dipping his paintbrush in a water bucket and then a little bit of pigment on it and then doing his glaze. Mm -hmm. So like the whole grayscale aspect like Della does and Salter a lot usually, that's where I saw him. I mean, he come up with a Starbucks cup, some spray paint and black and white. And he, I, I think I went up, walked away for like three minutes at the most. Mm -hmm. This was one year Earth Dance. Mm -hmm. I came back and it was like, 
multicolored from a grayscale and I walked down some multicolored and I was like, how did you, how did you do that? Uh-huh. I think I was comfortable enough with him at that time. I'd met him like a couple of times. I'm like, how the hell did you do that? Uh-huh. And he was like. Glazing. He was like, well, you can use medium, but you can also use water as he's dumping his thing. But he's also like, he's like, I don't like that. And he got a rag and he, he so wiped. So super watery. Yeah, and he wiped like, it off. That's in, that's in like drip? It didn't drip as much if you kept the consistency of the brush going. Mm-hmm. Um, that's the thing. That's the tricky part is like getting it that right. I mean, if you touch it, see, what are you going to dab it off? Mm-hmm. You can come back in, but it's still watery, but you've dabbed off more than you needed because there's still water on the canvas. Uh, I've never so, heard that, actually. Yeah, it's like yeah. over the years, I've made my own kind of technique. Like, I work fast. I work very, because uh, I'm trying to blend my colors, mm-hmm. um, or my, my gradients at least, trying to blend my gradients. And I have to do it with a lot of water because it smooths it, but I have to go back and forth. So at the time, I'm doing doing my darks, going all the way over to where my lights will be, and I'll come in with my lights, and I'll go in with my lights should be, and I'll push it, and I'll meet in the middle, and I'll go back and forth. I even do a lot of cross hatching with my brush, which I don't, I have never seen anybody do that, but for me, I'm spreading that pigment out, and then I'm, I'm getting it even, and I'll let it dry a little bit, and then I'll come back in, and I'll put some white and some dark, and I'll build it up, and then I might put another glaze. Yeah, so it's kind of like a mish technique, but very yeah. loose and yeah. very watery. Yeah, yeah. I guess it's my, you know, my own little way of doing it, because I never had anybody teach me. I just, I witnessed it, but not to a detailed extent where I sat through a workshop watching somebody do it. I just saw somebody, like, do it in a couple minutes span. Great. So I'm not and like, it worked with what you were doing. Yeah, at the time, especially if you're out in the middle of a cow field at a festival trying to paint. And it's the middle of July and your paint dries before you can actually smear it on the canvas. Mm-hmm. It's the water, which I don't use medium for the medium might actually help too, but I know for a fact water works. And right. that's why I don't own. have to pay well, I don't have to pay for a medium. Mm-hmm. The water is usually pretty accessible at anywhere I go. So I can just bring my pigment and my water and I'll mm. knock out a painting. Nice, I'll give it a try sometime. I, I don't do that technique too much, but uh, when I do, I certainly am not doing oil and egg tempera at least, you know, I'm I, doing acrylics. I want to try oils yeah. just because it's mushy and blendable. It's tight. Like I think you're, like if you did what you did with oil, it would come out like fucking tight. So and like it's, it'd be something to to do even to see if you can do it play around even if you wanted to still go quick with acrylic on. Well, see, I would just look at Frank Frazetta. You know Frank Frazetta. Uh huh. His backgrounds. I love his figures. I love his like concepts and stuff like that. But his backgrounds with the like minimal color. With I mean I guess he's got his triad going on with like two or three colors in his painting and it's all mushed, and he might have like. A, a hard angle in there somewhere. It's a light, subtle, hard angle. You're like, oh, well, that's part of a building or a cliff or something like that. But everything is just so mushy. There's not really a, a horizon line that you can really tell, but you see that there is depth. Mm-hmm. And it's so loose and messy, and I love it. I have mild OCDs, and so like, I'm very, can be very tight sometimes. And to look at his stuff, I, I can't do it at this point in my life now I've always been practicing to be more mushier mm-hmm. that's why I think I maybe I need to try some oils because yeah. just that 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 background I'm, my figures are always probably going to be crisp but my backgrounds is what I don't want to be crisp I right. don't want to worry about my backgrounds mm-hmm. I want their I want your brain to figure it to out. figure it out right but I haven't gotten to that technique of making it mushy mm-hmm. but you know, impressionistic. There's, right. there's a lot of technique and there theory is. there to figure there out. There is. So you're painting in this in this technique, but who are you painting? Who are these women? Who do, rep- do they represent? Where do they live? What's this uh, alternate dimension huh. you're bringing forth? So, you know, I think that a lot of stereotypical aspect of it's funner to paint the woman figure. Yeah, I mean, for me, yeah, I'm attracted to the women, and so I like to paint a woman, too. I think, um, yeah, I, I think everybody likes a woman. Yeah, it's just, I mean, <laughs> the, women. one of the oldest oldest pieces of art was the Venus figure, which was a woman, you know? that that I think the woman's always been revered as 
as this goddess, you know, from early, early ancient times. Whatever happened throughout history, I don't know, but I think in early ancient times, I think the woman was just as equal or more powerful than, say, the man was, you know? Right. Um, to be revered in all this art over the years. Mm -hmm. um, but I, you know, being raised by a single mother, I've seen how powerful a woman can be. And I, you know, my mom only had one child. I'm an only child. I, to see these mothers out here with multiple kids, raising them, working three or four jobs, put food on the table, like, where, you know, where's the man at? Like, that's when I, I see this, like, boss, this power in this woman. And I don't know, I just, I, I've always brought out the woman figure, but my, my depiction of them has been very, I don't want to sexualize them, but I want them to be very elegant, yeah. but badass. Like, don't mess with me. Like, I, I can be very, like, comforting and peaceful, but I will also, like, fuck you up if, if I have to. Because that's what my mother did. Like, when I got in trouble, I, <laughs> you know, like, so I, 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 and as I got older, you know, the, my comic book days, um, there was a lot of women figures like Witchblade and Fathom, um, you know, Tank Girl, like all these. Uh -huh. But I'm also like a teenager, so I'm really like. But I, they're gotta be hot. They're like, like, really obviously like really <laughs> hot girls. They're all cartoon <laughs> characters. So at a young age, I was like, maybe I'll be a comic book artist. And I was looking up to all the like Michael Turner, and Mark Silvestri, and Todd McFarlane, and like all these artists that mm -hmm. helped even x-men cartoon in the right. 90s really helped me my proportions of mm -hmm. they're kind of a little extreme but very expressive you right because you're expressing Four the and, and, and yeah the knees being bent back with the foot right here is mm -hmm. like those depictions are important i think in the art art field especially like uh depicting human form um in a dramatic dramatic pose or scene mm -hmm. um i'm sure they did it in the renaissance era too but i don't know how many scenes there are people with spears coming down you know perhaps yeah but it depends on the topic they're painting right and so the vibe of the you know rich man room they're painting right <laughs> but yeah you know a lot of those comics and stuff really kind of helped me like tighten my work up understand figure art so i really got into that and so i pursued the woman i got into college i did a lot of like live figure drawing um which was great i'd never done it until i got into college so we like and we had a woman named Dorothy. She was she was our model. This is all I, I think we had two or three other ones, but Dorothy was the main one. Mm -hmm. Um Dorothy would come through <laughs> in her like fishnet stockings and I think she might have been homeless on mm. but she would get paid fifty bucks. And our, our teacher, Harry Harry Alley would like, I'm, you know, I'll come pick you up. We need a model today. So she'd be like, she'd come in. And it was so funny because she'd be in there. He's like, all right, Dorothy, be still. And she'd sit there like this, you know. Yeah. And then she'd want to talk to you. So she just. Really? Oh, no, no, no. She, I she, see she, she, yeah. Oh, so she no, started talking that's to not correct. You know? and we're like, Dorothy, no. Stop. Stop. <laughs> so uh -huh. what about that sports team, so, man? But like, yeah. So we're going to, you know, I learned drawing a lot of the women from that. And I got into talking to other artists. Even my, even my professor, you know. He would do not hyper realism, but he could do pretty good realism figures and portraits and stuff. Then over the years, you start to see it get super, super abstract. Still a, a human form, but there's nothing there. You like so much paint on it, he'll dig in with a knife and he'll cut it out. Uh, so you're like a human form going into the painting. Uh -huh. And it's just sometimes there wouldn't be any arms. It would just be a drip that goes and your brain's making up the rest of it mm -hmm. and he was like yeah you know you just get bored you get bored painting this tr traditional figure uh -huh. so you just like start to want to abstract it or distort it somehow mm -hmm. so over the years i've gotten like that and, you know i i got to a part where i was like i'm kind of confident in my figure work 
in my style that I would do. It's like a little above comic book style, but not, high, not realistic either, you know? Mm -hmm. It's a little, little area that I would float in. Yeah. And I was happy, I was like fine with it. I'm still there, I still like it. Comics um, is also a big influence. Yeah, 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 you know. That's why my, my uh, flavor of art is still very cartoony. Yeah, yeah. Whatever that means. Yeah, I mean, I, we're, we're that generation that still watches cartoons, we're like the yeah, first. Yeah. What's your age again? I was born in 84, so I'm 30, I'll be 38 this year. Okay, cool. Yep. Yeah, so kind of, kind of close. But yeah, we still read comic books. Yep. And I actually started reading comic books more seriously in 96 when I moved to Canada. Mm -hmm. And okay. I was uh, 17 then. Yeah, yeah. I was probably just getting into comics around 96, 97. Yeah. What comics did you read? At the time, I was really big into Spawn. Spawn was Spawn. Big. Um, Do you still have number one? I still have number one. I sold mine. I think I have two copies of my number one. I, I if you don't <laughs> buy it off, yeah. I so when I go back home, one's that one's back home in Georgia, and one I yeah. got here. But you know what I do have, and I also have double copies of these too. Oh what? I got Todd McFarlane's last few issues of Spider Man when he worked for Marvel. Okay. Before he quit to start Image Comics, mm -hmm. start Spawn, so I. There's like Spider Man. I don't think it's Venom, but it's he's in his black suit. Right. There's like multiple copies I, of I it. I really want number three hundred, Amazing Spider Man three hundred. Three hundred. Where like Venom coming out of the cover and shit. Ooh. Um. But once again, uh, back, back to your ladies. Uh, <laughs> is there some kind of like interdimensional? So yeah, so world, I can, maybe I can, law. What's, so what's what story? happened was I was doing my. I was always into like. Uh, mystical kind of fantasy stuff fairies trolls gnomes you know I was at a young age was interested in mushrooms even though I didn't know why people were interested in mushrooms you know mm -hmm. uh, I had a velvet poster with the troll uh, the little gnomes riding dragonflies with mushrooms rolling around and another one that said eat me and I'm like Okay. Sixth grade. I don't. I don't really know why, but I, I'm assuming it's cool because they make art about it, right? Uh -huh. So like later on, I try. I try mushrooms, acid. At what I, age do you start doing mushrooms and acid? So I was 18 whenever I I ate acid for the first time. And my buddy, spring break, first semester in college, spring break, and he came down from UGA and he brought the Alice in Wonderland Cheshire Cat. Mm -hmm. He brought like two two strips. They ate two hits that night, a couple hour span, and pretty much it was like changed, kind of changed my life. I, I, you know, there was, I was already interested, but it was only because I was interested in because I had Jimi Hendrix, The Grateful Dead, um, Edgar Allan Poe, Col uh, The Doors, huh? The Doors, The Doors. I, I, you know, I was already into these these musical acts. I had read poems by Coldridge and all these. Uh, Poe's alcoholic holders was a um, laudum addict. They had had these psychedelic experiences and it came out in their work. Mm -hmm. That's what made me interested. Mm -hmm. I even never tried a psychedelic. But I was really enticed to try it because the guy that brought it down was our salutatorian of our high school. He's the smartest kid in our high school. When the UGA he comes back and it's like, here, <laughs> it's like oh, I trust you. He's one of my great, one of my great friends. Mm -hmm. So I was like, I trust you, obviously. So I ate it. I remember that night hugging, hugging trees. I, I was like, I know why they call hippies tree huggers now. Mm -hmm. it's like I felt so connected. I remember sitting in the grass, and I was like, these little baby shrubs were at my buddy's house. His parents were gone for the weekend, so it was like probably like six, or seven of us out there. You know, you first you're like all buddy buddy, and you're all like hanging out. By the end of the night, you know, we we're all like kind of separated. We we're all like doing our own little things. We we're all like tripping pretty hard. Right. Um, I remember sitting out there, and there was this tree I was talking to, like blessing it. Like, I just the the oneness that I felt with nature blew my mind. You were I, communicating with yeah. this thing you had seen, but all of a sudden you realized it had life. How much? I, how much or more appreciation? Yeah. Holy cow! Just I just felt it. That like changed my life, but you know, when the next day, you know, he was like, "I know you aren't probably gonna find this around here too often." He's like, "But like mushrooms that grow in the cow fields, they've got to be around here." It took us about a month to find the right ones. 
And my buddy Josh, he was, he decided to try it. I kind of convinced him not to do it because we didn't know for a fact. He ate it. He called me back a couple hours later. He's like, this is it. This is the one that works. I'm like, I know where to get them at. I was like, tight. So we got there and we find them. We pick them. Uh, got lucky enough that we found a field right next to my buddy's house. Um, my gosh. I mean, every weekend, every weekend, we would go eat mushrooms. I was never a big drinker. South Georgia. What age is this? 18, 19, okay, and 20. And that's before you moved to Atlanta. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah I didn't move to Atlanta until 2000. 12. I I lived in my college town for eight years, but it was better than my hometown. But this was when I was still living in my hometown. We could pick these mushrooms. And it was, even when I went to my college town, I was still going to college, but I would still, I would be in my hometown and commute. But when I moved to my college town, we'd still come back and get them. We'd have them during the winter time. I mean, I eat so many mushrooms, I'd black out. There was one time I got my vehicle. I was confident enough. We live so far out in the country. It's not going to pass anybody on the road. We were just riding dirt roads. But I got my truck and I dipped. I was so high. And I started having, I've never been great with rhyming with my words or anything. I can't freestyle or whatever. But at that particular time, I was driving down this dirt road and everything's moving and like... <laughs> Is it safe to drive? No, you? not at all. Do not do that <laughs> at all. And I'm driving down this dirt road and I'm probably going like 10, 15 miles per hour. And I started getting this like... Um, what was... It was like the weirdest rhyming lyric. I have been the western wind. Where I've come, I've come back again. Like it was just going through my head, and I remember just like, ah! it's like I gotta write this down. <laughs> so I'm like looking at my middle console, and I'm like probably forgetting what I'm doing Probably. while I'm doing it, you know. Yeah. And so, finally, I just turn around, and I leave, and I, I turn around, I go back to my buddy's house, and he lived down this lane. It was about a mile long, but it was just covered in woods, you know, just pine trees and thickets of wood. And I'm riding along, and it's probably like. 11, 12 o'clock at night, and my my headlights are shining on the pine trees, and the pine trees are just melting. And I just remember just sitting there, and that was the last thing I remember until I remember knocking on the back door of his house, and I was like, and he comes to the door. I'm surprised that there was, I mean, well, I guess they were still like, because we were all tripping. And he comes away, he's like, what's up? I'm like, can I take a shower? He's like, yeah, so I come inside and I go to like the bathroom and I just like taking my clothes off and I look and it leeches all over my legs. Like a, I, a hallucination? No, they were there. I was burning them off. Leeches? Leeches. I don't know where I was at. I have no idea. I just, the last thing I remember is parking <laughs> my truck looking at a pine tree in this thick oh of woods. Oh my God, yeah. what the so fuck, dude? After that, <laughs> after that, I was like, no more. I will not be doing this anymore. Or not so much. Not perhaps. so much. But I think, uh, you know, you gotta, like, we would pick them. We would go out there and we'd have so many, we'd have to take our shirt off and tie them with holes, sleeves, and we would just be piling them in t shirts. Uh -huh. There were times we'd just dump them out on the counter and we'd have mounds of mushrooms. Wow. And we would just eat like, tw I'd eat like 20 cats and just be like, ah. Oh my God. So yeah, it's after, hard to measure what when you're. Yeah, so I had no fresh. idea how many I was eating. I had no idea. I just knew how many I was counting. Some were this big, some were that big. Yeah. I it was just so high, and yeah. these were just field shrooms. So when I got in the, when I started going to festivals, I wouldn't eat mushrooms. I was like, I'm not, I'm not down with it. So we just eat acid. <laughs> and I was like, ah, I've done plenty of mushrooms, done acid once. So we started eating acid, we'd eat acid double up acid, to go into festivals. So that whole experience is really what like circulated and I marinated on in my life that has spit me out at this point now. I'm just like, mm -hmm. psychedelics. Oh yeah, which goes back to my figures. <laughs> um, this whole time she thing. is a, my experiences of like smoking DMT, I tend to come in contact with entities a lot of the times. In my last one, I, I, I had that. I, like it's my second one. It was a female. Yeah. And she was crouching, and she was kind of like shooting all these patterns at me and shit. It's it's uh, intense, man. That's 
so my concept for my figures, especially say her back there, she's mm -hmm. like, that's called I'll Take You There. Mm -hmm. And she's got a little, these little DMT elves down at the bottom. They're all hiding behind her. But like, right. she's sitting there and she's like not playing around. She's like, you mm -hmm. called me here. Yeah. What's like, up? yeah. So the right. whole Are we going? Are we evolving? What's going on here? And, uh, <laughs> and another thing is like, even not about, because DMT is very, very, very profound. Even for anybody that say has never tried a psychedelic like mushrooms or LSD, that is curious about it, but a little scared. Um, it's where maybe one of these women would come into play. It's this very motherly, comforting aspect of a woman, and um, very she's very comforting, but she's also like weird looking, strange, or something Surreal. weird about her. Yeah, it's like she's patterned out. She's kind of scary, but she's also like very like elegantly standing there, like waiting for you. A lot of my portrayal of them, either they're looking at you dead on, or you're watching them in a moment of something. Um, I want a person that has always been interested in doing it, has always been kind of scared to be more enticed of like this is my art. This is kind of what you're going to go through. Like let the mother come in and comfort you while she takes you through this wild, crazy journey that you're about to go through. But just trust in it, you know? Right. Um, yeah, it's very ayahuasca vibe. Yeah, yeah. And so, and I've never had actual done ayahuasca, but my, my DMT experience has been very intense. My chonga experience has been very, very intense. Really, yeah? Yeah, so, the gratify, mm -hmm. waiting for Polish to come on. Mm -hmm. My buddies uh, come over to me. He's like, "You want to try Chonga?" And I'd smoked DMT with him before, which, you know, mm -hmm. there's a time. But Chonga is supposed to be lighter. So Chonga has an AOMI inhibitor mm -hmm. part of it. I think I said that right. Um, but what it does is like when you're smoking, you smoke like a bowl. It's like a bowl of weed. It looks like it looks like alien bark to me. Mm -hmm. uh, you smoke it like you're smoking weed. But it doesn't hit you as fast, but it lasts longer. Mm -hmm. So we're sitting there, and it was the it was the weirdest thing. We're sitting there. It was about dusk, dark. It wasn't quite dark outside yet. And I'm sitting on the grounds field. Jay and Kelly are sitting right there, and they're like, "Here, he's parking at this bowl." And I probably hit it four or five times before it finally starts like kind of kicking in. You, know, oh, you yeah. smoke DMT. You go, Ooh, it's immediate. Right. Sean's like four or five hits later. Huh. Different than like how I've done it. Really? I've done it just like smoking it, like just like a few puffs uh -huh. and then let it do its thing. Like, well, that's what we did basically. It's like we were just passing around. So I hit it like on my fourth rotation around, like I hit about my fourth time before it started to like, I felt anything. But what made me notice it was them, they were trying to explain to me, they're like, you know the difference between Chonga and DMT? is like, DMT puts you at one with nature and everything around you. He's like, Chonga will put you at one with cosmos, is what he was trying to say. But he was like, and, and when, and, 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 and when, when, the, and then, and then. <laughs> I think you're breaking up, dude. And that's what he did. <laughs> he went down and his, his girlfriend was like, here, I'll, I'll finish it. And she started trying to talk, talk, talk to me like that. And then she just went down. And I watched them act like that. And I remember looking in this direction and I looked up and everything started to just like this. And my eyes went up into the sky. And so there was this horizon, like trees and trees. And you had the sky here. No shit. I tell people this story all the time. I think I told my mom this story. Cause this is fucking crazy to me. I saw these two huge, alien heads in the sky it's clear as fucking day they were t they were so big they took up the entire horizon line but they were touching heads like this right next to each other like a gray big head big eyes little mouth little nostrils but they had elf ears oh and they had these quartz crystal crowns what? like they were some you know Badass evolved alien. I, I mean, like they were some royalty family of aliens sitting there staring right down at me. And, you know, if you were in your right mind, you'd probably shit your pants if you saw something like that. Holy shit. If I saw a ghost, I'd piss my pants, probably. I'm sitting here experiencing this, and 
I got the most comforting feeling. Like, don't worry. Like, we're here. Don't worry about it. And I just like, instead of my asshole puckering up, like, oh my God, what's going on? I just like, <sighs> just let it happen. And then everything got wavy. Surrender. It was the wildest thing. That wasn't one of my most. Well, that's perf- ayahuasca. It's got ayahuasca in it. Too. Yeah, it's basically, it's DMT and AMO and hot. A- o- M- yeah, but ayahuasca too. Okay. So Which I, does, ayahuasca doesn't have DMT in it. It's Chacuna so I, has. DMT. So I thought ayahuasca was the AOMI inhibitor. It was like a root, and then the DMT was part of the vine that they would mix together. Uh-huh. But you can't digest DMT. Your body won't allow it, which I think is interesting. Like you'll purge it. You won't feel effects if you try to eat. Uh, you know, a plant or something with DMT, or if you try to eat the powdered DMT, you can only smoke it. Or like, I've heard people injecting it, right? Ooh. So the people I've heard injecting it was probably some YouTube podcast, but they couldn't get high smoking it. Huh? But they said when they allowed somebody to like inject them with it, that an immediate blast off, and they were sitting on a table, and there was these alien light beings. Um, Doing surgery, surgery on them, yeah, yeah. Um, which I thought was wild. I've never had an extent of anything like that off of my experiences. I had a really profound experience of smoking DMT. I was tripping on LSD, but we went back to a friend's house, or a friend's house, and we were at a festival. We went back to their campsite, and they packed up a layered bowl of DMT. I'm like, DMT weed, DMT weed. And there must have been like seven of us. I didn't know any of these people at the time, except for one guy. And I just walked back there with them, and they were all, all right, I'm like, all right, let's try. So I hit this thing five times. And that rocked me. I sat there. Was that right after the the Changa? No, so the Changa was, I think the Changa, might have been around the same year. Okay, but not, the same, not, fest- the, not the same. Not the same thing. festival. Okay. Uh-uh. I was like, this no, guy's uh-uh. a nanomo. No, uh-uh. <laughs> uh-uh. No. I can't anyway, remember. It rocked you really hard. So yeah, so this was like, um, I, you know. You, you smoked that DMT and it rocked you. Like, what happened So what then? happened in my life at this point in time, it was like I was being very, I don't know what the best word is. I was, I was being uh, ungrateful for a lot of what was going on in my life. I had graduated college. I was painting at festivals, but at this particular point in my life, I was like freaking out about finances. How am I gonna pay my bills? How am I gonna do this? I was worried about this, worried about that, worried about this. And not really appreciating what I had going on for me. Mm-hmm. And I didn't, I didn't even think twice about how I was viewing it. And that night we sat there and we smoked some DMT my buddy that I knew, he got up and left, and it was during Lego Land session where he like gumbied out, so he was like gliding. He didn't walk; he just kind of glided away. <laughs> like I watched him; everything's just like <laughs> my eyes are open. I'm just sitting there like this, like. And the buddy in front of me, I'll never forget this either. He hit it first. We all, like I said, four or five hits in. He stands up and he goes, "This is wild to me." He stands up. So smoking DMT, I just stand up to begin with. But he stands up and he goes, and he sits back down. He was speaking in like this ancient throat tongue. But when he stood up, his head elongated. Whoa. And he got a third eye in the middle. I'm doing all this with my eyes open. Like, Damn. what the fuck? But I'm sitting there like this, like, <laughs> you know? So that blew my mind like the amount of entities that come in contact either morphing from you or coming out of whatever is around me like the swanee down there is very there's so many so much energy and spirits down there many interactions down there but the entities i don't know that's where I think that she comes from. Okay. She is a... DMT realm entity. She is a, like an earth mother. She is a protector of earth. Mm-hmm. She is in all kinds of history. Like I'm painting Medusa right now. Like, right. Is it know. always the same woman in different no. versions or is it different it's, um, entities? It's different entities. I, you know, I like ancient mythology and ancient cultural mythology, folklore. 
stuff that is like, you know, like the Christmas story is <clears throat> so embedded in our culture about Santa Claus with his reindeer flying around delivering presents. You even have your Nordic version of it too, but it really dates back to the, like Siberian shamans who lived in their little nestled in huts in the winter and they would go out to hunt, but there'd be little Amanitas growing up under the cypress trees, which look like Christmas trees, mm -hmm. in the tundra, which is above where most trees can even grow. So let alone like you got the cypress tree, which is only one tree that can grow. And these mushrooms that grow, little red, white mushrooms, colorful. That look like Santa Claus. <laughs> color, color of Santa Claus, exactly. But they're growing up under this tree, and they're like little presents, all colorful and shit. So they go out there, but I, you gotta imagine even before they understood that what the mushroom was, they were watching the reindeer. The reindeer were eating them. Before, I think before religion was a prominent thing, like people worshiped certain animals. Mm -hmm. um, you and look, that's why the reindeer started flying. <laughs> they, because they watched them eat the deer, or they watched the deer eat the mushrooms, and they were like, our godly, this godly beast is eating this. It grows out of their poop. Like, what is this thing? So they'd eat it, probably trial and error, probably make them sick. They realize when they like boil it down or dry it out, they can eat it. So they start, having hallucinations of it, watching the reindeer <sighs> jump. It looks like they're flying. So you got this whole aspect of that. And then you got them later on going out. Well, we know if we dry them out while we're hunting, we'll go pick them, hang them above the bottom branch of the Christmas tree, of the tree. When we come back from hunting, we'll pick them up and we'll take them back to our hut. We're snowed in, so we have to go through the chimney style area. They come down and they hang them by the fire in their socks so they'll dry out. Mm -hmm. There's Christmas. There's your Christmas story. But where do the elves come to play? I'm like, is that DMT elves? Like, yeah, maybe you ate you an know, apple like, and then you go to DMT. Maybe. So, what do you think, John? Like, does each psychedelic take you to a different dimension? Or maybe there's just different frequencies, like a building with many uh, floors, and I, maybe like the mushroom takes you on a certain frequency that acts as one floor, and <sighs> DMT takes you to a higher floor, and Bufo takes you to a floor that encompasses the whole building, but from a different inner viewing that's really, of it. That's or, really good. You know, my, I think, I think mycelium mushroom, the mycelium connection here, I like to really think that like scientists is believe that it's so alien to our planet. They might even thought it might have like came here on an asteroid of some kind. Mm -hmm. um, the way that the mycelium connection is like two or three layers of topsoil, it connects everything and every plant grows through it. It's very amazing seeing that you have some mushrooms that cause hallucinations or psychedelic experiences, right? You as a human think you're the most advanced species on the planet, but I can eat this mushroom here and it makes me question my reality. Then no, you're not the most advanced species on the planet. Actually, the most advanced species on this planet is probably these trees and plants growing out here. Mm -hmm. But they all grow through this mycelium. So they think you even compare the mycelium to your brain, like you cut a road into the dirt, you're cutting off that connection that the mycelium had. So they're gonna reroute it. It's like your brain. It's like, I guess, getting Alzheimer's. You know, that part of your brain doesn't work anymore. So like, rerouted. Probably not remembering the right thing anymore. Um, but I think that my, I, it's like that movie Prometheus. There was somebody that said to me one time, or I read it, I can't remember. But I remember, the, I remember it saying that if you were an advanced species, we don't, we only know, we've been on this planet homo sapien for 200,000 years. It's a long time, but not compared to how long this planet has been here, mm -hmm. that we think it's been here. I'm open to believe that there is a lot of older history that has happened here that we have no idea about, even advanced cultures and stuff. You know, Atlantis, you know, is one of Lemuria. them. Lemuria. Lemuria is one of them. Like, these places like that, I mean, they're still in our history, they're still in our dialect. We still they, talk about they it. They influence, they left an yeah. afterwave or an echo. So I think that there is a, a lot of history that we don't know about that happened on this planet. And this, what I read was that if there was an ancient species on this planet, advanced species, and they were either about to die out or they had to leave, but they wanted to leave some kind of way to communicate 
with another species on that planet if it ever became able to be lived on or that species evolved enough to be able to communicate. So I was like, that's pretty good. And they were like, how would you, how would you leave? You know, wherever you're thinking, like carve in a rock. You know, it'll last a long time. Mm-hmm. And then you have the Prometheus thing where they're like, you know, that guy literally dumped himself into the water. He right. Well, he, he, he ate he, something, right? I can't remember. And it affected him. And then he started deteriorating and he fell into the water. And then that was the seeds of the, the he alien. Fused, he fused yeah. that. It was basically, they were like, how about leaving some kind of a DNA or uh, something in a, a way to communicate? So I was like, mushrooms, like we eat mushrooms and we have these experiences. Even go back to like shamanism where they're having psychedelic experiences and going to this alternate realm, asking questions and coming back with answers of some kind. Um, who's to say that that's not really there, really happening, you know? I don't, I don't know who would deny that. Like, I, I believe in it, and I, that's yeah. why I'm well, into I shamanism. Think, <laughs> I feel like, you know, the people that have experienced something or, or even have that sixth sense and those, there's something else going on out here. If you haven't been kind of, say, brainwashed by religion and believe that certain, this is what you're supposed to believe, man, a good psychedelic experience, that was the closest thing I've ever come to talking to God mm-hmm. than ever going to a church or reading a Bible. Uh, all religions are so interesting, but I just personally believe that most of them were spawned from a certain psychedelic experience that somebody had that they were trying to tell somebody else. Like, do you think uh, do you believe in the ancient astronaut uh, theories? Um, so I I really like to believe I like to play around with the theory of the Sumerian tablets where they talk about the Anunnaki coming to our planet every thirty. 3,600 years, their planetary rotation around their solar system will come into ours. Mm-hmm. So I, I can't remember. Do you believe in that one? I like to believe in that. Ooh, I, that's a scary one to believe. It's, it's, well, you know, it's the oldest written history we've ever uncovered by Homo sapien. Like, that was their origin story. Uh-huh. Origin stories are crazy. A lot so of them explain are. to our So the, the Sumerian, the Sumerian tablets talk about the Anunnaki coming from the 12th planet. Uh, you would count our moon as a planet. I sometimes don't believe that. Um, but either way, that would be two planets outside of our solar system that they lived in in another galaxy type thing. But so, uh, you know, I watched it on Gaia, the Gaia channel. They talk, they have like the, uh, some Anunnaki show. Mm-hmm. This man was really put it into great terms of like they came over here, they were mining for gold, they were searching for gold because they had mined it all on their planet. For what they used it for, I cannot quite remember. I can't remember if it was space I, I travel. Remember, uh, I read it from the uh, Drumvalo Melchizedek books. So basically, they were mining gold to make it into particles to cool their planet so the sun would uh, reflect out because it was getting too hot okay. or something. Or maybe too cold and they needed to reflect and more. Insulate it somehow. Kind of like a forced global warming. I knew they needed it for effect. something. So they sent the king... They sent the king to look for more, and he found it. They knew it was more inside of our solar system. And they come inside and find it on planet Earth. They come in. They have to mine it. Uh, so they, I guess like us, they didn't want to do it. They yeah. were like, well, let's create, let's create something that will do it. So I think that's where the Nephilim come into play, the giants. The, even in the Bible, it's the children of the angels, the Nephilim. So they made a lot of experiments with humans. They, they, and and that's what interests me is like, if Homo sapien wasn't around yet, then Neanderthal might have been walking around here. Even before Neanderthal, like Homo erectus or whatever one, what were they getting that DNA at to cross with theirs? But they, what they said is they impregnated an, uh, an Anunnaki mm-hmm. female. It gave birth to a the first human. They named it Adama. Mm-hmm. Adama means first human. Adam, I'm watching this show. I'm like, pff, pff, like wow, I've never so heard of this. So they grabbed like a monkey man. Not that's monkey right, yeah. Man, and, 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 and that's why there's a an, missing link, perhaps. Right. So they said they fused it with an Anunnaki. The Anunnaki woman gave birth to the first human, and then they had a female, and they that was who they were going to get to mine. Um, I think the Nephilim were giants. I can't remember the, what they talked about. I don't know if they were too hard to handle or what happened. 
but they bred the first humans to and be we, slaves in the minds of the right. World. And we like to reproduce like crazy. They said that we reproduced so fast that they couldn't control us and they left our planet. Mm -hmm. That's what that was all about. And I was like, whoa. And is their planet supposed to come back in orbit? At Every 3,600 years. And so in 60 years, I think it's 60, in 60 years. I think in 60 years from now, that's when their planet is supposed to come back in orbit. Which is what that show said. So I was like, "Let's see what happens." Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 let's see if we're still around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we might be right there, at the, like the break of it, watching the world end. As They're we like, die. I don't think these guys are going to make it till our next return. Because they said there'd be like a massive destruction because of, like. Um, but even when the planet comes, its orbit probably fucks with the whole planet. Yeah, the magnetic fields of our planet get all fucked up. Right. They said that, like, that's why. Yeah, like. I think the last time was one of the the Great Flood happened. I think that that was one of the last times that they talked. If that the Great Flood, was, I think, supposedly happened uh, twelve thousand years ago. Twelve. So that was yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. Twelve thousand. That, that might be the. Yeah, in, yeah in I mean, you have to like do some timing. But I don't know. I feel like that was one of the. I'd have to go back and watch some of that Gaia channel episode. Yeah, but that's a, that's a gist of that. Yeah, 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 uh, yeah, yeah. That uh, 12 planet Anunnaki. Well, so even when I and say they that, say that some Anunnaki still live on planet Earth, and they're probably the the reptilians that fucking have a hold on planet Earth right now. I'm not even sure. I, I you know, I there are Pleiadians. There are the Lyra. There are the Lemurians. The Anunnaki. There are so many different yeah. species of. But, but, but they're beings. probably on different frequencies. That's, that we can. Uh, that's so, you know, for me, I personally, I, I personally believe if we're, if we're talking about, and you know, our government has fed us, we're conditioned to believe that aliens are little green or gray men walking around, physical beings that we can touch and see, right? Flying little metal spaceships and fly around. Like, I find that honestly very hard to believe after especially smoking DMT and having these experiences of these, entities and seeing those damn aliens in the sky at the time like blew my mind because i don't know if that was my brain projecting what i saw or right. if that was really fucking there but that still blew my mind yeah. um well I, I, like when i talk to psychics who have that different frequency like bigger grasp then they see the aliens then they see the mayans depending right, on right. the specific powers right. too but i i definitely you know i definitely believe that a lot of those will in induce like I was telling you earlier about that movie about that made up drug that they were smoking like dropping that knowledge which is, made up drug that uh, was that welcome to Willits movie well okay. it was supposed to be like that DMT but they didn't call it DMT in the movie mm -hmm. but they were like the guy was like yeah I truly believe that there are certain psychedelic substances that when you take them it lets you communicate with aliens or interdimensional beings mm -hmm. I'm like what because right. I swear I, I don't I think our government has tried to condition us to believe that there are little gray men flying metal ships around. Right, our physical, because like, we're, I, like we're, we're always thinking that this is all there is. Right, right. I do not but, believe that whatsoever. But once you open up the scope of different frequencies and dimensions that are here, but at a different range. Yeah. Like you said the building, I, that was a very cool uh, analogy for because I always talked about it as like a radio station. I'm like, mm -hmm. we're like on 97.3, this is our world. Right. You switch some DMT, you might go over to 101.5. Mm -hmm. We're still an FM station. Right. Well, with my, building, radio station. with my building analogy, I'm still keeping it physical as opposed right. to like, you right. know, it's all, there's no space and there's no time really right. once you break from that. Right. Perhaps there's, just, I don't know. But definitely, you know, it's just vibration. Yeah, and what it's, we it's, can, uh, what we can perceive. Right, that's the that's thing. I think we're still very low in our evolutionary brain process to understand the experiences that we may have off of the mushrooms or the plants that we take. Like, I've never had cactus before. I've never really tried any kind of cactus. But I hear that those are like, I mean, those are amazing because they've been around for so long. Like, mm -hmm. Cherish is a sacrament. Yeah, it's um, different. Yeah, it's a different yeah. vibe. Too. Yeah, like you can see less, perhaps. But also Feel depends it. on amounts. Right. I've I've heard that those you know are very good to go to, and I'm very pro psychedelic. Like I don't eat a lot of psychedelics that much anymore. But it's good that the world's loosening up and it's yeah, less illegal, think, and they're on the it's TV amazing. and all culture. I can't believe that I I can't believe I can go to the store and buy marijuana. 
let alone hearing that hey i can go ride around denver colorado with mushrooms and not get in trouble or i can go to oakland california and they have dispensaries and churches out there that you can go like mm -hmm. they just need that in all health centers if you want to try it you should have the right to go in there and try it right in a, in a safe in a safe environment yes if you want to explore your brain i can't you know our government obviously knows what this stuff does to us let alone it wouldn't be illegal as much as it is but i think that in the long run they are missing out on a ton of opportunities that they could benefit from i mean look at watson and crick invented the double helix model tripping on LSD and then you have like uh, uh, what's this Steve Jobs coming up with the whole idea of the iPod and stuff like right well that, this like, has changed our whole humanity can only evolve from psychedelics and seeing outside of our exactly. range but does government or the no. powers that control no. government do no. they want us to evolve no, and wise up and get not opportunities or they want to keep us as a bunch of slaves exactly that's why you know I, you, you take it like this I've I've been I've been a psychedelic user since I was 18. I was started. I went to my first festival at 21 or 23. I was blown away. It's wild, wild west. You can do whatever you wanted to. It's everywhere. And as I got as I went, I mean, when I first started, Mike could go to four festivals a year. There might have been four, five a year. And then it just became like every other month. Then you had some in the winter time. Then it was just year round. Then it was almost like every weekend. There's a festival going on almost every weekend. Every year. So this place it blew up. But I was like, all I, I mean, all we're we're out there is like schedule ones and twos are rolling rabbit out here. They're everywhere, and all these kids are trying it. Like, why didn't the government come in here and been like, yo, we're shutting this down because we don't want you doing that stuff. I was like, well, they haven't done that. It's only got more popular. But you don't expect, like, you got these Wakaruka, Wakarusa, Arkansas cops. I remember one year they had pictures of peyote buttons. They had LSD, mushrooms. They had every drug you could probably think of in the back of their police cars taking pictures. This is a newspaper. Mm -hmm. This backwoods Arkansas town. They'd never seen half of this stuff before, ever. Didn't even know what half of it was. Hmm. You don't think that, that is recorded and sent to the you know the feds or whoever our government has record oh well, these festivals are really getting out of hand here with all these psychedelics it's like i always wonder like why do they shut them down why do they stop this well, if you can't beat them join them so then made me paranoid i'm like are they making like crazy like chemicals like we're getting research chemicals these days we don't know what it is but we're told it's acid like some people are freaking out there's bad shit going around I was like, are they yeah, fucking... Propaganda tactics at the end. I was like, are they fucking making stuff and putting it in? So that kind of freaked me out for a while. I didn't want to go down that rabbit hole. But that was something I always kept in the back of my head. You know, I was like, so much I don't trust the government. Yeah, well, you me know? neither. Yeah. <laughs> but, Especially these days. Uh, but yeah. let's not go down too no, yeah, that depressing rabbit cool. hole. But uh, despite the efforts of the powers that be to keep humanity's evolution and uh, vibration lowered, do you think humanity still has a chance to raise their vibration to the point where we could be able to communicate with the aliens and communicate with the Mayans that move forward and hopefully get to the good part of our history. I, not, not that there's going to be like no badness, but like more goodness. And I, more think, I, th I, th I think it's, I think it's almost say destiny. I think it's inevitable for that. And I think that there are just forces out here that are trying to prevent that. Right. Um, but I, hard. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I just believe that, um, you know, I want to say that I believe hardcore in like, what do you call it? Where everything's already planned out. Right, there's an agenda. Yeah, I don't, I not necessarily believe that, but I believe that there is. There's a negativity in this world. There's greed no, and yeah, power yeah, yeah. and fear and yeah, I don't know. Maybe, uh, the, 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 we don't really know. We're no. speculating. I think, the, you know, I think a lot of that's part of a balance too, unfortunately, you, you know, to appreciate the good, you gotta have a bad kind of thing, but We've been conditioned to th always think that it's like, you know, all the 
I mean, you can almost with anything. The, the 80s monster ballads were always sad songs. Those are the most popular ones. They're sad, negative, sad songs. Mm -hmm. um, everything that you remember from a past relationship might be the bad things. Like, we're always conditioned to to the bad, but, you know, we're always, like, preaching. Just remember the good times. Like, remember the good times. Mm -hmm. Be positive. Be positive. Be more positive. Like, it's just, it's... It's easy. It sounds easy. It's not easy it's, it's when you're conditioned. Road, for yeah, sure. when you're conditioned to think negatively, uh, and it's not like you're sick. It's not like it's only you. It's like it's everybody has this problem. And it's just breaking. I just read the Four Agreements. That book. Oh, I love it so much. Um, so that's like it's a very good book. I know that was written in '97. I'm way behind. <laughs> mm. But um, yeah, I just read that. It's really been a little very cycle like, small things you can do to be more positive in your life very simple book yeah, but yeah. very profound yeah, yeah, so do you yeah. remember the four agreements yeah yeah it's um uh be uh what is it with your word be impeccable impeccable with your word, with your word. don't make assumptions um don't take things personally and do try your the best. best you can yep, do your best yeah yeah which is pretty much good they're very yeah. are all very simple but it's like it's it, they can be very i catch myself every day oh yeah you're just like oh and it's like it said in the book. If you catch yourself and you messed up, you start over. Yeah, yeah. Try the best you can. Yep. Number four. Yep. And try to use your word in a way that's not black magic. It's right. always uplifting. That's a that you know, that's an ancient vibrational power I think that humans had a long time ago that we still say is curse word. Mm -hmm. But I think in ancient times like, 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 like back throat noise vibration come out it'd be like that'd be a vibrational curse whatever that word sound was that came out it'd be a negative thing so are you optimistic that humanity can yeah. make it i think so i think that it is something that you know i hate to say it and i guess it's just like human human nature we wait till the last minute we wait till the last minute until it's almost too late to be able to change these things and i think that's one of our biggest lessons that we need to learn as a whole to not wait around to the last minute to like figure this stuff out when we start to see problems try to fix it but yeah i think like i said it's inevitable you know i don't know what happened we're still on this planet we're the only upright human natured person that's that's still here like we have a little Neanderthal in our genes and stuff, but we're the only ones that survived. I think humans are, we got this special thing, and we, we do encase God as everything else, but, mm -hmm. you know, I think we do have a chance to waken up. I don't know how. I, I, I'll try the best in my life in my own way, and, and you know, and everybody hopefully will do too, but hopefully something will just will move to the you, higher vibration of the galaxy. Have you ever heard Dolores Cannon, you know Dolores? Yeah. So she talks about how... Uh, the world will end and it's in all like most religions um, Armageddon and she talks about how one earth will burn and the others will ascend you That's know to the higher it's like human it's like a sun that will split it's like a, 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 a fertile egg in a womb that splits and you have twins she said that that's what's going to happen. So you're going to have your negative and your positive, and you're going to have an old earth and a new earth, and it's going to split in two, and all of the negative people and everything that just drags down is going to stay here, and everybody else will sin. And I've always thought about how that would play out. How would I physically witness this go down? Would this actually, would that actually it'd be like a science fiction movie? But then I got to think in realistic, I was like, what if I just went to sleep one night? And it was all a dream. I wake up and I'm in this higher, like nothing ever happened. Like I, but, but don't you feel sometimes like these days we live in the same place as a lot of people, say family members or friends, and their perception of reality is so different than yours. It's like, are we even living on the same planet? Like oh, yeah. you think that this is what's good, and I think that this is what's good, and you think I'm bad in contrast, and what's going on here? Why, why are we missing? Uh, and it's, even, it's interesting because like a lot of our parents' generation lived through the 60s and 70s. It wasn't probably like they might have not have tried psychedelics and had this experience. I, what gets me a lot of times is our parents' generation might be like very like stick stickler about certain things and not understand where we're coming from. And I'm like, but... I have an open mind. Like, I thought you were open-minded. You know, I always joke around, like, 
ah, oh, they need to eat some acid, you know, or they need to eat some mushrooms, kind of like open them up. But our parents, some of our parents are so closed minded. And I'm like, but you did, you did open your mind at one point in your life. Mm -hmm. I thought you would understand. So it makes me kind of wonder. Well, the thing is, sometimes you're on a path and life is tough with lots mm -hmm. of wounds. And yeah. if you don't start repairing those wounds at one point, then the trauma is just going to get like more fortified right. to a point where like the glue is too strong to break out of the right. chain. And maybe they started doing some work, but then they had to make money or they got right. a and job. And they that generation too is really, that was a big thing. Yeah, you know, that I think that that happens, unfortunately, where we might not see eye to eye, but we're so close. Mm -hmm. Well, as yeah. long as the love's there, yeah. Yeah. hopefully we can all live in a yeah. planet of love. I just think as, as a whole, like generation-wise, I, I look at, at the festival scene as a small bubble. That bubble is growing, growing, growing. It, you know, it was a prominently, when I first started, it was just a hippie culture. It was a hippie culture, but now you see all kinds of religions and backgrounds and ethnicities coming to festivals and we're all hanging out and we're all like we love you we're hugging each other we're giving each other high fives so i don't even know you but you're like part of the group now like that's magical that's very important as an evolving community that is not going to be like the past generation mm -hmm. that's yeah, beautiful it, it really is it's really Plus the newer souls are coming through yep. got a different software yep that even though they're trying to dole them down at the from like younger still they know what's up and still i think uh we're all we'll do our part to make this work out that's like the three ways of volunteers with if you heard about that with dolores that i don't know so she talks about the three ways of volunteers the baby boomer generation was the first wave to come through they heard a cry for help mm -hmm. these baby boomer generation was the largest population of souls ever born on this planet at one time mm. So if we're reincarnated on this planet, and they're like, where did these extra souls come from? They were brand new souls. So they said they were all volunteers. They heard a cry for from help mother from planets. Mother Earth. And they're like, she needs help. So they all came in, baby boomer generation. Then their kids were the second wave of volunteers. So it was interesting. She says- well, What was those, the amethyst? So or, it was- uh, Indigo, the indigo the children. The indigo children, yeah. Yeah, that's who I am. Woo. Yeah. <laughs> so she, she said it was interesting the way she said, like the first wave comes in, they find the path. The second wave comes in, they pave the path. The third wave comes in, and they walk the path. The crystals. Like they, yeah, they're the ones that are actually going to change, but we have to teach them and show right. them. Hell yeah. So I was like, that was, I mean, Dolores was like 80 something when she died, and she's traveling yeah. the world trying to like. My ex wife uh, was learning her. Uh, her technique of really? uh, hypnotism really? the, the week that she passed. Yeah. Uh, she was, her name got brought up multiple times in my life before I ever clicked the two together. But one day I was watching a documentary about her and I was like, I've heard about her before. Mm -hmm. And man, I spiraled down with a lot of her like books and all the stuff that she was talking about. But all that stuff's super interesting to me, like the afterlife, how you pass over, where you go. I believe in reincarnation, so I do believe that we are recycled here and come back. Mm -hmm. um, for her, and even Brian Weiss's um, Many Lives, Many Masters, like he was a skeptic. He was just a therapist, hypnotherapist. But that woman went back in past life and was like, not sure if he believed it at first. And then he's like, there's no way that she's making this up. There's right. no way. So he does his research. He's blown away at this yeah, point. Yeah, yeah. And by this point, like, I can't say that stuff's not real. That stuff is truly like amazing to me. But the psychedelics that we experience, I think has a lot, like DMT, smoking it in your body. Just teaches you that there's so much more to reality mm -hmm. than we think there is. In I the also feel bar. like that's, that's the way it feels when you die. I, I almost feel like that's that feeling when you're like leaving your body. Um, which I don't know if that's a morbid way to think about all this stuff, but like, it's interesting how your body reacts when you smoke it, because it's like you're dreaming too. It's REM sleep. Your body's completely paralyzed. You're viewing shit that's going on around you, but you can't you can't do anything about it. That's why I think it's amazing that guy stood up when he was. Mm -hmm. like, what? But maybe he was possessed by spirit. And he, he was possessed by an alien because he turned into that thing. <laughs> Talked some like tongue shit and then I sat back down. It. I don't know if he cursed me. I don't know what he did, but oh, that's so cool. wild. Well, John, we're coming to the end of our show. Do you have some final words of wisdom that you'd like to share with our viewers? Yeah, like, you know, 
if you enjoy it, keep it up. I was never thought I would make it this far as a painter trying to paint stuff that I wanted to. I mean, maybe thought I'd have to go into a marketing career, but don't give up on your dreams. Like it's kind of, don't do that. Hell and yeah. it's amazing how many people will actually pay you for something that you like to do. Hell yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so much, John. It was a lovely yeah, conversation. Yeah, man, thanks for having me, man. You cracked me up so much. <laughs> And thank you guys for tuning in to another week of Chris Tires Creative <laughs> Friends. Um, please make sure to like, subscribe, comment, share. Let's keep on expanding this lovely project. And I'll see you next time. Blessings. Woo! Next episode, my guest will be Daniel Pinchbeck. I think art, um, you know, opens up imaginative possibilities for what humanity could be, uh, and it allows us to, you know, think beyond maybe the limits, you know, of, of what we're what we have in terms of economic systems, political systems, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so please make sure to subscribe, like, comment, and share. Big thanks, and see you next episode. Peace.